All right. Um, again, uh, thank you for having us. It's my pleasure to, to be talking today on migraine pathophysiology. This is something that's of particular interest to me, so it's something that I really enjoy talking about. But I think within the context of this meeting, it raises a few questions right off the bat. Uh, number one, what in the world is pathophysiology? Uh, number two, why do I care about pathophysiology of migraine? And number three, how does this relate to the overall theme of migraine and mood and what, how can we tie all that in? And hopefully uh, by the end of this, I can answer all of those questions for you. So pathophysiology is basically just the study of the underlying mechanisms that cause a particular disease or condition. Um, and I, it's something that I think we all ask ourselves when we're thinking about migraine. Well, what is migraine? I just went to the doctor and they said that I have migraine headaches. What does that mean? Uh, what is the underlying process that's causing me to have these headaches? So I think it's a very fundamental question when we're thinking about migraine or a lot of other conditions as well for that matter. Uh, but I think it's important because if you understand how and why a condition occurs, you can better understand how to diagnose and treat it if you're a provider. If you're a person who has migraines, then you can better figure out what's going on and what you can do to help manage it better. Uh, but again, I think it comes back to this fundamental question of, well, when we say migraine, what do we mean? What is a migraine? Migraine is a lot of things, but I think first and foremost, migraine is a genetic condition. And I apologize, I didn't get any polls together or do anything with that. But if we had an audience in person, I might ask everybody to say, who here has migraine? Raise your hand. And I'm sure in this audience, that would be a lot of people or else you wouldn't be here. But if I were to say, okay, of those of you who have migraine, how many of you also know of somebody else in your family who also has migraine? We know that if you ask large numbers of people that question, about 80% of people with migraine have some other family member with migraine headaches. So it's clearly something that runs in family. There's clearly a genetic component to that. A very long time ago, back before we had the technology to do genetic sequencing or any of the technology that we have today, they used to do what were called twin-twin studies. So you look at identical twins and you look at non-identical twins and you say, if there's a particular medical condition that someone has who's a twin, is it more common in an identical twin or non-identical twin? If it's more common in an identical twin, then that suggests that there's a genetic link. And a long time ago, they did those studies and with migraine, Identical twins have a much higher rate of, of migraine compared to non-identical twins. So for a long time, we've known that there's been a genetic link. It's not something that we've really been able to sort out completely until fairly recently. And honestly, we're still at a fairly early stage in doing that. Uh, but with newer technology, with the ability to sequence genes, or in some cases, an entire genome, we have started to tease out some of the genetic factors that play into migraine. And we have been able to further confirm that in fact, this is a genetic condition. For better or worse, this isn't a genetic condition that's caused by a single gene. There have been a number of different genes that have been potentially implicated in causing migraine. So this isn't something like, for example, cystic fibrosis, where there's a single gene and we know what that gene is, and we can look at that one gene to say, do you have this condition or not? For better or worse, it doesn't work that way. There are a number of different genes that we know of that might be implicated. We don't yet have a way of testing those genes. That might be something that at some point in the future, we will have a migraine gene panel and we can just send off genetic testing and say, okay, yeah, you have these cluster of genes that means that this is what you have and you have migraine headaches. But for better or worse, we're not there yet. But we're starting to learn a lot more. So it's clearly a genetic condition, but not one that we can conclusively demonstrate through clinical testing yet. And if you look at what has been done in genetic testing, you look at family studies where they look at large families and they do what's called linkage mapping, where they look at affected family members and unaffected and see if there are genes that show up in one group during, uh, versus another, or there are what are called genome-wide association studies, where you can look at very large numbers of people with and without migraine and see, are there some genes that are more common in one versus the other? And there have been a lot of themes that have been identified in some of these genes, but again, there are more than 30 candidate genes that have been identified. But there are genes that are related to sleep-wake cycles, which may help us to better understand some of those triggers and how that can happen, related to various ion channels within the brain that are involved in signaling of nerves and, and messages in the brain. Um, 
different uh, neuronal factors and different factors that are related to ions within the brain, which again, help us to kind of understand a little bit more about what's going on, but not a perfect answer yet. So we know that this is a genetic condition. Well, what else do we know about migraine? We know that migraine is a condition that results in inappropriate activation of pain pathways in the brain. So there are pathways that are present in everyone that if you do something that would normally cause a headache, like hit your head or have a sinus infection or something like that, there are pain pathways that get triggered. But there are pathways and networks within the brain of people who have migraine that get triggered by things that shouldn't necessarily cause a headache. And that's fundamentally what's happening with migraine is inappropriate activation of these pathways. Why these pathways get inappropriately activated is something that we're going to be talking about, and some of the speakers following me will talk about this in a little bit more detail, but that's essentially what's happening. And I'm not going to go through this uh, slide in great detail, but just to summarize what's going on with these pathways, there are blood vessels and nerves that are in the covering, which is called the dura, the protective covering around the brain and the spinal cord. And there are various factors that can cause signals to go through an area called the trigeminal ganglion into the brainstem and up to an area of the brain called the thalamus. And that's what causes, or what, that's what allows us to perceive pain. And so it's activation of this pathway that causes us to perceive a headache. And in the case of migraine, activating other networks, a whole host of networks around the brainstem, as well as areas up in the cortex and a whole vast network that has a complex interplay that all leads us or leads to what we call a migraine headache of a lot of the features of migraine headache. Now, one quick aside, so that's kind of what migraine is. It's a genetic condition. It involves pathways and networks within the brain. But what isn't migraine is a condition that involves the blood vessels. And the reason why I mention this is that for many, many years, there was what was called the vascular theory of migraine. There was an observation that with migraine, there was abnormal vascular reactivity. Blood vessels would constrict in people who had a migraine aura and then would dilate during the headache phase. And everybody thought that's what caused migraine. Um, there is an article written many years ago by a doctor named uh, Peter Goadsby uh, called The Vascular Theory of Migraine, a great theory ruined by the facts, where they kind of went through and showed that, no, this doesn't have anything to do with the blood vessels. It has a lot more to do with the nerves and networks within the brain. And the only reason why I mention this is that this is something that's still mentioned out there. If you, you know, Google migraine and you look at a lot of different places and a lot of different information, there are still some places that will claim that, but that's not true. And I think it's important to know that that's not true because again, if you understand what's causing this, you're gonna better understand how to manage it. And so I think that that's something that is important to know. It doesn't mean that blood vessels aren't completely involved, but in this case, that's not the primary thing going on when we're talking about migraine. So this is a, something that came from a review article from several years ago that I, I kind of like because it kind of summarizes what we think is going on with migraine. So there are different modulating factors, uh, medications, different things within the environment, hormones, genes that we just talked about, all these things that modulate brainstem excitability and cause these pathways within the brainstem to be inappropriately activated. This brainstem activation in an area called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis causes activation of pain receptors. It also causes activation of other areas that lead to a lot of the associated symptoms with migraine, the sensitivity to light and sound, the scalp sensitivity, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, all of these things are a result of this inappropriate activation. And so this is what we try to better understand. We kind of have these pathways known, we know that these are being activated. What we're trying to understand now is what influences that, what modulates that, and what things can we manipulate, can we influence, can we do, both as people who have migraine headaches and as providers taking care of people who have migraine headaches, what can we do to help control that, to help treat that? So, that's great, that's very interesting, but again, what does that have to do with this talk and what does that have to do with, if I'm somebody who has migraine, what can I do? Again, I think knowing the mechanisms and the pathways involved in migraine can help provide better treatment. 
if you're somebody who's taking care of somebody with migraine, knowing these pathways and knowing how what you do in terms of medications, in terms of other approaches, how that's going to impact these pathways is going to be very important. If you're somebody doing research on migraine, knowing some of these underlying pathways and where you might target them can help you to discover newer treatment options. And there are good examples of that with some of the recent medications that have been FDA approved for migraine. Um, and again, if you have migraine headaches and you know what can trigger the, these pathways and you know how these can be modulated, then that's something that can help you to manage your headaches better. So in conclusion, migraine is a condition that involves pathways that are structurally normal pathways that everybody has. But in people with migraine, these pathways get inappropriately activated by seemingly benign triggers. Identifying these triggers and understanding why migraines occur can help to prevent and treat them. So there's one last question that I still have an answer that I have to try to answer, which is how can I tie this into our overall theme of the interplay between migraines and mood and between migraines and mood disorders? Well, I think that there are a lot of ways right off the bat that we can do that. Number one, we know that people with migraine have an increased incidence of mood problems, things like anxiety and depression. And we know that that's not directly related to just having headaches. It's not that, well, if you have a lot of headaches, that would make anybody anxious or depressed. It's independent of headache control. People who have migraines that are very well controlled still have an increased incidence of anxiety and depression compared to those who don't. There's a genetic link. That should be something that we think about if we're people who are researching it or treating it. How can we tie that in together? If there's a genetic link for migraine, there's a genetic link for these mood disorders. We know more about the underlying biological processes for these mood disorders. How can we tie that in together? Because we can better understand that, we might be able to better treat it. The other thing is that in looking at some of these pathways, we know that that can be influenced by mood. A lot of times people will say before a migraine, they get kind of irritable. There are some mood changes or people who are around them will say, yeah, you get kind of moody before you have the headache. And we know that that has to do with activation of an area called the hypothalamus. And so that's involved with that. We know that mood changes can occur both before and during and after a migraine. And so when we're thinking about these pathways, we have to think about how mood influences all of that. And that might help us to better understand and manage that. So it all ties together. And I think it's all personally very interesting, but I also think from a practical standpoint, it's something that if all of us have a better understanding of this, we all are going to be able to do a better job of managing migraine headaches. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. And if you want it, you can either unmute yourself and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or if you want to use the chat, I have the chat open. So anybody who wants to type a question in the chat, that would be fine as well.